We've been following the narrative lectionary this fall, and so we, we got off lectionary for a couple of, of Sundays, and so I just want to orient us briefly, right? We started with the creation stories, then we followed into Exodus of the people from Egypt, then we moved into the establishment of a land and a kingdom, and now we have moved to the prophets, which brings us to Jeremiah this morning and his prophetic work. Will you pray with me? O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Words are powerful. So powerful, in fact, that some try to burn them. Book burnings have occurred throughout human history. The Chinese emperor Qin Shi Huang ordered the burning of books in 213 BCE as a way to consolidate his rule, largely books of poetry, philosophy, and history. Many ancient rulers of Rome turned to book burning as a way to prevent the spread of foreign customs. Books have been collaterally burned through the wider destruction of war, as was the case with the famed Library of Alexandria in 640 AD. Slaveholders burned abolitionist texts throughout the South in the 1850s, and the Nazis burned any text deemed un-German in their attempt to create a pure culture including books by Jewish authors, socialists, pacifists, and liberals. Religious texts of all traditions have been burned countless times, often by adherents of a different tradition, including the 1992 burning of Tamil Hindu texts by Sinhalese Buddhist extremists. It seems that for as long as we've had the written word, we've also had the desire to destroy it. In the United States, it has become more popular to ban books or to challenge them for removal in school and public libraries. The American Library Association tracks this activity and includes these titles in their list of the top 10 most challenged books of 2023. Gender Queer, a memoir by Maya Kobabi. All Boys Aren't Blue by George M. Johnson. The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison. Let's talk about it. The Teen's Guide to Sex, Relationships, and Being Human by Erica Moen and Matthew Nolan. These join the ranks of other classically banned books, like 1984 by George Orwell, The Color Purple by Alice Walker, basically anything by Toni Morrison, and To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale is another commonly banned title, so much so that Penguin Random House created a fireproof version that was sold at auction for $130,000 to support Penn America's efforts against book burning. The promotion for this auction, you can look this up, uh, the promotion featured Atwood herself blasting the unburnable book with a flamethrower. <laughs> it's pretty cool. <laughs> All of the texts I've named thus far have at least one thing in common. 
They challenge traditional power structures, be it the topic of race, gender, sexuality, or government. These books tell stories that counter the powers that be, and the powers that be don't like it. Today's text from Jeremiah may very well be the first recorded episode of book burning. Jeremiah has a prophecy for the king. The king doesn't like it, and so he sets it ablaze. The role of the prophet wasn't so much to tell the future as it was to theologically interpret the present. I know that this text sounds harsh, right? Verse 3 says that when the house of Judah hears of all the disasters that I intend to do on them, all of them may turn and forget their evil ways. Jeremiah isn't so much telling the future as he's looking at the present, at what's going on, and interpreting it. The prophets of the Hebrew Bible can be thought of as ancient social and political commentators. Therefore, we need to know something of Jeremiah's context if we're to understand his prophecy, his commentary. Jeremiah was a prophet in the kingdom of Judah in the early 660s, sorry, 600s BCE. He was a prophet for over 40 years. And he's sometimes referred to as the weeping prophet, as he's the attributed author of the book of Lamentations, as well as Jeremiah and 1st and 2nd Kings. The front of today's bulletin is a painting of Jeremiah by Mark Chagall. The black and white print doesn't totally do it justice. I encourage you to look it up later or look at the email that was sent out. It's a painting that captures the sorrow of a man who prophesied through and lived through the destruction of his homeland. Chagall paints him tenderly holding the Torah the word of God. In today's story, Jeremiah is once again called on by God to prophesy against the immorality of the current leadership. The kingdom of Judah is in a precarious position, facing invasion by the Babylonian Empire. This is likely why the people are fasting. Public fasts were called often in the face of a national emergency, like a military invasion. In his prophecy, Jeremiah lists the events of recent history and draws a connection between these events, the moral bankruptcy of the kingdom, and the current precarity of Judah. Jeremiah calls for repentance with the hope that those in power will change their methods of rulership. A scroll containing Jeremiah's prophecy eventually makes its way to the king. There's sort of a bit of telephone that happens to get it there, but it eventually makes its way. And perhaps predictably, the king doesn't like what he hears. And so he attempts to get rid of it, cutting off section after section and throwing the words into the fire. The king shows neither fear nor remorse as he attempts to turn God's word into ash. But guess what? It doesn't work. Because what does God do? God says, write it again. Write it again. Jeremiah is called on to dictate another scroll with the same message as last time, 
although there is an additional section that's added on that addresses the king's most recent act of hubris. The king cannot silence the word of God. The king can only temporarily succeed in the destruction of a single scroll. And that's the thing with book burning, isn't it? Or book banning or book challenging. It doesn't work, at least not in the long run. There may be temporary success at censorship, but the story itself or the stories themselves cannot be silenced. That's important to remember in these times when there is a very real attempt to rewrite history. And many fear the erasure of their stories. The stories of poor folks, of queer folks, of trans folks, of BIPOC, of women, of children, of everyday people striving to do what is right. These stories cannot be silenced, no matter how hard some may try. These communities cannot be erased. This also means that there is prophetic work to be done. We may not think of ourselves as prophets, or as social commentators, or even as storytellers, but I believe that we all possess prophetic capabilities. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, often had a challenging word for the people, but in chapter 31, he brings a more hopeful tone. What we heard read earlier is part of a much longer prophecy, and it starts with these words. I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. I will build you up again. It's beautiful. This prophecy in Jeremiah 31 is God's love letter to the people. And it contains within it God's plan to establish a new covenant. Now, we don't have the time this morning to go through the full history and theology of covenantal relationships in the Bible. So for the sake of today, allow me to summarize and, and simplify. God made a covenant with the Israelites in the giving of the Ten Commandments. And it was a beautiful relationship, and yet the people struggle to hold on to it. They build a golden calf, they lose their faith, they disobey God's instructions. In other words, they're human. They're human. So in this passage of Jeremiah, God decides to make a new covenant, one that is based solely on divine love and holy grace. This new covenant, God says, will be written on our hearts and on our minds. It cannot be broken and it cannot be destroyed even by the worst of our human failings. As Christians, we understand this covenant to manifest through Jesus. Jesus embodied the grace of God and showed us that nothing, not even death, can silence the word of God. Indeed, as Paul writes in his letter to the Romans, neither death, nor life, nor height, nor depth, nor rulers, nor angels, nor things present, nor, th nor things to come, nor powers, nor our own failures, or anything else in all of creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. I have loved you, 
God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love and there's nothing that you or anything else can do to silence that. We live with this covenant written on our hearts and written on our minds, and we're called to embody it as best we can. And this means that we are living texts. We have that prophetic capability, all of us. We're living texts. We can prophetically tell the story of God everywhere that we go. I met with a group of fellow clergy this past Thursday. It's something I do once a month. And one of my dear clergy friends was lamenting something that I think many clergy or perhaps many Christians do these days. Her congregation is quite small, about 10 people. And she was lamenting that she, she wasn't sure if the church was really doing anything, if, if the church was really doing the work and lamenting because it seemed like no one was really noticing. And yet she was also telling us how a group of Ukrainian refugees has been worshiping at that church in their own language and how members of the congregation have been helping these refugees figure out things like renter's insurance and how to get various documents that they need and, and how to find a place to live and how to enroll their kids in school. And I said to her, my God, that's, but that's it. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's not going to get on the front page of a newspaper, but who else would have done that? Seriously, who else was going to help someone figure out renter's insurance? It's complicated. It's complicated. Who else was going to help figure out how to get the kids enrolled in school? Who else was going to give a place for these people to worship? That's prophetic. That's prophetic. It doesn't matter the size of the congregation. It doesn't matter whether it gets news or not. It's prophetic. We can be prophetic. We can tell the story of God through things that we might think are small, but they're not. We can tell the story of God when we bring a casserole over to our grieving neighbor. We can tell the story of God when we plant vegetables in the garden that grow into carrots or apples or watermelons that we can give thanks for eating. We can tell the story of God when we treat people with dignity. That's so important. When we treat people, no matter who that person is, with dignity, we tell the story of God when we share what we have. We tell the story of God when we say to one another, I'm sorry. Or when we say to one another, thank you. Do not doubt that each one of us can tell the story of God, and that means that the word of God cannot be silenced because it lives in you and you and you and you and me and we won't let it be so with the help of God and the grace of God thanks be to God amen and by his love, sweet blessing.